Good evening, everyone. My name is Ryan Bailey. I'm the chief editor at the Sana Center. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to this Yemen uh, media call, uh, including the journalists in attendance and participants in the Sana Center Yemen Exchange Program. Um, our guest today, and we have the privilege to be joined by uh, Dr. Nasser uh, Khobaji, uh, a senior official with the Southern Transitional Council. Uh, Dr. Khobaji is chairman of the STC's political commission and head of its negotiation affairs unit. He's been involved in politics in Yemen uh, since the early 1990s and was elected as a member of the House of Representatives during Yemen's last parliamentary election in 2003. He later emerged as a, as a prominent leader in the Southern Movement, uh, which was uh, advocating for uh, the South and against the political and economic marginalization that it experienced under uh, the government of former President Ali Abdullah Saleh. Uh, he more recently served as uh, a governor of Lahaj as well. Uh, so Dr. Khobaji, uh, thank you for taking the time to participate in uh, this uh, media call today. And I'm sure we're all looking forward to hearing uh, the perspectives of the STC on recent developments in Yemen. This call is scheduled to last uh, one hour and 15 minutes. We're going to take uh, approximately 20 uh, uh, to 30 minutes for the initial discussion and the rest of the time will be devoted to participant questions. I would ask that uh, participants uh, raise their hands if they would like to ask Dr. Khobaji a question and then I will call and take uh, two to three people at a time. And please keep your intervention short and your questions focused uh, so we can get through as many as possible. Uh, so if that's okay, uh, are we ready to begin, uh, doctor? Hello, sir. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, how about we'll start with uh, one of the most uh, notable uh, developments in Yemen in the recent weeks has been was the visit of a Houthi delegation to Riyadh as part of ongoing, ongoing negotiations between the Houthis and Saudi Arabia, facilitated by Oman. These uh, talks have raised hopes among some that there may be progress towards a political settlement in Yemen, but there have also been concerns raised that the talks are excluding uh, many other Yemeni factions. Uh, for instance, uh, President Idrus al-Zabedi of the STC uh, told the British newspaper The Guardian uh, that your group has been sidelined in the talks and you were receiving updates uh, via media. So I wanted to start out by saying, what is the position of the STC uh, on these ongoing negotiations between the Houthis and Saudi Arabia? And if you received any further information on the main, is uh, on the main issues that are currently being discussed. Thank you very much, Ryan, for this question. I would like to start by welcoming all of the participants in this, uh, in this meeting all of the uh, media outlets and members of the human exchange. I'm very happy to be here and to answer any questions you might have. I'm interested to hear any questions or comments you might have and, trying, and to try as much as possible to answer them within the time that we have set for this meeting. Going back to your question, Ryan, on the ongoing negotiations or the agreements that were reached in Saudi Arabia between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Houthis. There is no doubt that the president and leader, Aydarus Zubaydi, has said in several interviews, and not just the interview with the Guardian, not just that this is a problem of marginalization, exclusion of the STC, but all of the other actors, all of the other relevant actors, are completely uninvolved in this track. And I think all of the components in the Presidential Leadership Council have no updates on the agreements and the talks that are being conducted, and they still have not been briefed on the discussions that have taken place in Riyadh. But in all cases, we believe that any agreement between Saudi, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Houthis is a positive development. It is a step in the right direction. And we are completely supportive of these kinds of agreements and talks, regardless of what their outcomes might be. And we, under, we recognize that all of these talks will help lay the groundwork for any future political settlement, one that all of the relevant components and actors on the ground will participate in. There is no doubt. Well, we don't want to move too far ahead. And 
judge any of the agreements or the talks that were conducted between the Houthis and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And I think that when these talks are complete, and we have more complete information on what the nature of these agreements are, the STC will have a clear position or a stance, whether positive or a negative one, towards these talks. But we are all hopeful that the results will be positive and that all of the uh, relevant actors will participate in any future political process. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. It's, it's almost like you uh, saw my next question. I was going to say that other parties have also echoed a similar sentiment to uh, President Zubedi about being uh, excluded from uh, the ongoing talks. Um, so my question would be, um, do you think this could provide an opening for the STC and other components within the government to work uh, together and coordinate efforts to respond to whatever the outcome of these ta the Saudi Houthi talks uh, are? I think that should be the case. That should be what happens. But we're waiting for a position by the PLC. The PLC still hasn't met for it to have a very clear position on these talks. All of the part this includes all of the parties that are relevant in the political process. They're all members of the PLC, but they still don't have a clear position. For us as the STC, I think we have very clearly expressed our position in several ways and on several occasions uh, uh, saying that we will whether with regards to our position on the Saudi peace proposal or the positions taken by President Aydar Zubaydi on several occasions when he said that there was exclusion from these uh, talks and that there wasn't sufficient information or updates or briefings on progress. But unfortunately, these other actors do not want to clearly take a position towards these talks. Uh, they could be happy with what's going on, or they might have reservations but are unable to say anything or unable to respond. And I think this is unfortunate in our point of view. It's unfortunate for these actors who are an important part of the negotiations and the political process for them not to be included. So the STC has been very uh, vocal in uh, terms of advocating against the exclusion. Uh, it seems that you are actually calling for more support from other uh, parties within the Yemeni government to support the STC in, in that way. Is that is that correct? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, I think that they hold, they have the same position towards them, and it's and it's better to coordinate. It's better for us to work as one. And I think we all share the same position on this, which is to confront the Houthis first and foremost. And that is what we reached in during the most recent health consultations, that all of these political actors will be unified under the Presidential Leadership Council to deal with the Houthis, whether through war or peace process. Unfortunately, however, the PLC still faces, still has significant differences, many of these differences, and its position is weak, if, uh, if not absent. And a follow-up, have you had any discussions with uh, the United Arab Emirates on uh, their position regarding the Saudi Houthi talks? Do they have uh, more information that they've passed along to you? Or has there been any attempt to align positions between the UAE and groups in Yemen that it supports, such as the STC? Based on what I know from President Zubaydi, our brothers in the United Arab Emirates uh, are also not being briefed on these talks, and they're also excluded from the process. And has there been any contacts between the STC and Saudi Arabia? I said you're not getting past information, but what are the lines of communication uh, been like uh, recently? Because there have been times that have been marked by more tension between the STC and Riyadh. And do we think that uh, there are certain factors contributing to that tension more than others? Uh, for instance, insistence on certain points uh, that your group uh, uh, advocates for in terms of a settlement that the Saudis might be against? 
In all cases, we, 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 our primary concern is to end the war, and we want for there to be serious confidence-building measures, uh, especially with a focus on the humanitarian aspect. But with regards to the economic aspect, including the payment of salaries from the resources and wealth of the South, this is completely re this is completely rejected. And so any discussions of the, ec the economic file is a political file, and it should be done, uh, discussed and dealt with during the political uh, process and should not be included as a part of the humanitarian uh, discussions. And I think this is where we differ with our brothers in our in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We do not think the salary should be paid to the Houthis without there being a framework to discuss the southern the issue of the southern people. Uh, and one more question on this topic. Uh, President Zubaydi gave an interview to The Guardian uh, in June. Um, and I thought one of the points that was interesting is he said Yemen is moving to a situation where the STC controls the south and the Houthis control the north. So based off of that framing, it almost seems that you, the, uh, the, you could envision uh, direct talks between the Houthis and the STC on some final settlement. Is that something that the, part, you know, the STC would ever consider? And what would that mean for other parties within the internationally recognized government uh, if it, you do have these two groups, one resent, uh, representing mostly northern Yemen and one representing mostly southern Yemen? I think th this might be um, what he said might have been misconstrued. What he meant is that the relevant actors, the actors that have an influence on the ground, which we consider to be the Houthis in the north, and th the relevant actors on the ground, I think that with the most influential one being the STC. But this doesn't mean that we want to negotiate with the Houthis directly. We are committed to a process uh, in partnership with the Arab coalition and also with our international partners. Any political process must be under the auspices of the region and the international community. And so we don't want to go we don't want to put the carriage before the horse that we're going want to go into direct talks with the houthis the houthis are still rebels they've carried out a coup they are not legitimate in any way they're militia that cannot be recognized and i think we've seen many examples throughout our uh, history that these militias violate any agreements they reach we've seen this several times they they talk about peace but are not serious do not have the real will to do that and even during the truce now it's mainly on the it, well, the truth is mainly in the media whereas violations continue to be committed on the ground by the Houthi militias and so there cannot be talks with the Houthis unless they recognize the cause of the southern people and recognize the legitimacy the internationally recognized government and then we can go into talks with them within the current coalition or alliance that we have. Uh, thank you, doctor. Um, for now, uh, maybe we can move on to discussing some more recent internal developments within the STC. Um, in May, there was a large meeting uh, held in Aden, the Southern uh, consul uh, Consultative Meeting that brought together many different Southern groups. Uh, and one of the outcomes of that was the appointment of several new officials to the SCT Presidium, including uh, 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 Mr. Zubaydi's uh, fellow PLC members, Faraz al-Bahsani, the former governor, governor of Hadramaut, and Abdurrahman al-Mahrami, the Giants Brigade uh, uh, commander. This also uh, included the declaration of a southern charter, and later in that month, the STC held its sixth national assembly in Mukalla. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what do you see as the primary factors that were uh, pushing the STC to uh, organize these meetings and what do you view as the most noteworthy outcomes of, of them? The consultative, the Southern Consultative meeting uh, that was conducted in May is not a new process. Uh, it's, it's a part of a process that the STC has been undertaking for a very long time to have peaceful internal consultation meetings. And this is a very core approach by the STC in trying to resolve any of the differences in, in view uh, within the South. I think the SDC has been uh, successful in large part 
and reaching rapprochement with the political actors that were considered opponents in the past. And through these consultations and dialogues, we've been able to reach many agreements. And these agreements led to the uh, national, the Southern National Accord or Charter and led to a partnership among the various southern actors, whether it, we have a one state or two state solution. I think this was an important achievement for the STC for it to take this approach, one that is based on peaceful dialogue and peaceful consultations. These consultations and dialogue also led to, like you've mentioned, uh, two very prominent southern figures joining the STC, uh, General Faraj al-Bahassani and General Abu Zar al-Muharrami to the leadership of the STC. There were also many other southern components, uh, political actors in the south who have also joined the STC based on these consultations and others that we have started to work closely with and coordinate with. There are still uh, other components that we are we have ongoing consultations with and we hope that we reach a similar solution with the meeting of the the sixth national assembly of the stc being held in mukalla i think was also a normal development uh, we we hold the assemblies for the stc in adan or in hadramaut or in any other southern governorate and I think this, this has helped, uh, this has led to a lot of the momentum in Mukalla. Unfortunately, there were some people who believe that this, that holding the National Assembly there was meant to convey a message to local or regional actors, but this was not the case. It was a very regular meeting for the STC, and the popular momentum that we saw in Mukalla with the uh, National Assembly being held there and also with the declaration of the National Charter and the prom these prominent figures joining the STC is what led to this support. And we think that these are all positive developments and achievements for the southern, the issue of the Southern people, for the Southern people and for the position in, uh, in general. Thank you, uh, Doctor. Um, so the STC is now one of the primary components of the inter internationally recognized government. Uh, the STC has representation on the Presidential Leadership Council uh, through its president, Idris Zabedi, in the Council of Ministers, through various ministers, um, in Parliament, uh, through members such as yourself, and on other important bodies such as the Consultation and Reconciliation Committee that was uh, formed uh, after, as part of the presidential uh, uh, leadership Council. Uh, I want to ask, what are your current assessment of these bodies and their work over the past year? Some have been more active than others. Some have been more uh, uh, capable of fulfilling their duties than others. So I want to ask, what's your assessment and what's your perspective on how all these institutions can be better activated to assume their responsibilities and best serve the interests of the Yemeni people? Since the formation of the PLC, it should have been a lot more active than it was, and there were many more functions that it should have carried out. But unfortunately, it did not rise to the expectations that we had before its formation. There are several factors that led to this including, for example, the differences within the PLC itself. There were many different points of view. There were many different issues that uh, no agreement was reached on. And also because the various committees or the supporting bodies of the PLC, like the CRC, like you mentioned, they have not been fully operationalized. And this is due to the fact that the, the, the uh, internal bylaws and regulations for these bodies are not have not been prepared and it's not clear what its relationship is with the other committees, the economic committee, the military committee, etc. All of these bodies are meant to support the PLC, but they still have not become active. I think we can say that. Uh, I, I don't think that they failed or have been unable to do anything, but they have not yet been successful in carrying out the functions. And this is all due to the fact that the internal bylaws and regulations have not been approved yet. When we have these internal regulations and bylaws for the PLC, for the president and the deputies, the other members of the PLC, things will be much clearer. The, the, the regulations still haven't been approved. 
And this has led to differences and also a lot of overlap in the functions of these various bodies. Many of the decisions, for example, have not been issued and some decrees or decisions were approved without having full consensus within the PLC. And these are some of the factors for why the PLC and its supporting bodies have not been as active. And obviously the PLC not being as active or not as effective will be reflected on the government and the other uh, committees. I hope that these issues are resolved. And, but this dep depends on the engagement between the uh, president of the PLC and the other members. And it, there, there needs there need to be steps taken to reform these issues and to deal with these challenges so that the PLC can be effective and is able to manage the negotiations and confront the Houthis. Thank you. If I could follow up on one of those points uh, I, I i understand your uh your contention that some of these bylaws uh, for some of these other bodies have not been totally approved so that hampers uh the effectiveness of their work but parliament um has uh not met much uh during uh during the conflict i think maybe the last time it met was in uh Seyun in hadramot and i know there have been various efforts to restart the, the role of parliament and have it fulfill its duties under the constitution. Um, and so I wanted to get your perspective as a member of the, that body of uh, saying, what are the obstacles to kind of restarting parliament and its role uh, in kind of in the checks and balances of the Republic, which may or may not, including hosting uh, parliamentary sessions in the interim capital, Aden. There, there are many challenges for that the parliament is facing in conducting the sessions. I, I think, as you know, the parliament has been divided. There's a parliament in Sana'a, and then there's the parliament in Aden. And most a majority of the members of parliament are not in Aden. They're either in Cairo or Riyadh or other areas outside of Yemen. I think there are very few who are inside the country. So that's one of the problems. And secondly, the parliament is, is, is very old at this point. The last elections were 2023, 20 years ago. And I think it, it loses legitimacy the longer that, that goes on. And so with these problems, and despite and with all of that, the, the group that is there now, the current parliamentarians haven't been able to meet. And I don't know why there seems to be objections over the parliament holding its uh, sessions in Aden. This is this is due to the, or this goes back to the speaker of parliament and his deputies. I think they're better placed to answer this question. Um, OK, um, I want to ask now about some of the efforts that have uh, uh, been done over the past couple of years to uh, kind of solve ongoing issues between uh, the STC and some of the other components of the internationally recognized government. Uh, unfortunately, relations have not always been harmon uh, harmonious, and this has sometimes led to open conflict and just function the overall uh, work of the government. Um, but we have had things like the Riyadh Agreement in 2019 that led to the SDC directly joining uh, the government. And then the more recent Riyadh consultations when all political parties agreed to uh, a special track for the southern issue uh, in any political process. Um, I wanted to ask you about, has there been any progress on this special track for the southern issue? Uh, and then as a follow up with that, too, there are also unimplemented uh, aspects of the Riyadh Agreement. Um, I think probably the most notable one is, is the uh, efforts to unify all armed groups under a single uh, military and security structure that would allow it to coordinate more effectively against the Houthis. Uh, so if you could uh, provide any details on either of those tracks, that would be great. Thank you. The, the Riyadh agreement has not been fully implemented. Many of the items in the Riyadh agreement have yet to be implemented, whether in the political arrangements, but there are, there, there are also economic arrangements and military arrangements in the Riyadh agreement. Unfortunately, there are components who only want to focus on the military and security arrangements, even though they are more difficult, whereas they forget the political and the economic arrangements which come at the core of our problem. Because at the core of it, 
are uh, the, the differences and the problems either within the uh, the uh, legitimacy or between the STC and the government are political in nature. And so if we talk about the political aspect, the only thing that has been implemented is the formation of a government and the appointment of a governor for Aden, even though all of the southern governorates uh, should have had governors appointed. And there are many governorates especially in the south who have not had new governors appoint, uh, appointed to them as well as the economic arrangements the economic arrangements included restructuring and forming the central organization for accountability and control and accountability and the reformation and restructuring of the Supreme National Anti-Corruption Commission and also reforming the Supreme Economic Council and the Central Bank. And so these four institutions are very important for the economic well-being of the country. And if these and if these steps are carried out and if the STC is included in them based on the real agreement in the situation would have been very different. We would have been able to deal with corruption and deal with or provide many of the needs of the people of the country, whether in Aden or in the other liberated governments. But unfortunately, the main function that this uh, the government formed after the Riyadh agreement uh, were, were supposed to carry out have not been carried out. It, this government was supposed to be one that focused on service provision, on education, on health care, on electricity, on security and stability in these areas. But unfortunately, all of these issues have yet to be dealt with by this government. With regards to unifying military and security efforts, there wasn't an item in the Riyadh agreement stating this what it stated was to organize the, these or structure these military and security forces under the ministry of defense and ministry of interior but after the ministry of defense and ministry of interior are restructured and the stc is a partner in these two ministries then these forces can come under the management and command of these two ministries. But unfortunately, the ministries have not been restructured. The Ministry of Defense has yet to be restructured. The Ministry of Interior has yet to be restructured. Uh, a joint operations room should have been formed. And I think that this was the only thing that uh, was... This was the only step that was taken out of all these economic and military uh, aspects. Also, withdrawing or redeploying forces from the major cities, and this has been done with the exception of the first, the forces of the first military district in Seoul. These forces have remained there since 1994. Based on the Riyadh agreement, these forces should have been withdrawn from the city and redeployed to the front lines in the fighting against the Houthis. But this has yet to be done. For them to remain in Seoul, this is completely unjustified and they're, they're not benefiting anyone there and I think this is what led to the military and security arrangements of the Riyadh agreement not being implemented but I think that many of the items of the Riyadh agreement I think we've we've already moved past a lot of that with regards to the special track for the southern uh, issue this was one of the Riyadh consultations outcomes and was one of the re results of the uh, Riyadh consultations in 2022 that one of the reforms to be implemented, uh, or among the reforms to the government and the uh, the PLC, and this these two points were uh, achieved. That the southern issue will have a special track in the negotiations to focus on it, and this is one of the points that is is still a point of divergence within the PLC even. Unfortunately, the real agreement also stipulated another one aspect of the real agreement that hasn't been implemented is the formation of a joint negotiations delegation made, made up of both the PLC and the STC. This negotiations delegation, there was an agreement over the members of the delegation, but it hasn't been formally announced and the delegation has yet to be operationalized so that it could deal with the negotiations policy. I think if this delegation were to be operationalized, many of the differences would be would be problems that we could overcome. The main differences within the PLC 
are over the southern issue. The southern issue, many of the political actors have their own viewpoints and opinions, but and we, we have our own project and they have projects that are different from that or their vision for the future are different. And this issue can only be resolved through the formation of the joint negotiation delegation. And this joint negotiation delegation can facilitate internal dialogues between the STC and the other components of the legitimacy so that we can reach an agreement over what issues need to be discussed and resolved today and which issues can be postponed for a later process. And this de delegation is responsible for coming up with or designing a joint vision for negotiations with the Houthis. The PLC now does not have a joint vision for negotiations with the Houthis. If the Houthis were to accept a resumption of the peace process and negotiations with the PLC and the government, there, even though this this team, the delegation is there, they still have yet to meet and they still have not worked on designing uh, an approach or vision for the negotiations with the Houthis, especially on the issues that are contentious, contentious between us and the Houthis or within the uh, legitimacy itself. If this team, is, if this delegation is formed, and if a special track is allocated for the southern issue, I think this will help us overcome many of the difficulties that we face and will help resolve uh, the Yemeni crisis as a whole. On the special track for the southern issue, uh, I want to go back to a past effort to address this. The southern issue was uh, included in one of the working groups for the National Dialogue Conference. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, doctor, but I believe you and several other members of the Southern movement at the time uh, had issues with how the, the Southern issue working group was uh, being formed. So you chose not to participate in the, ND, uh, the NDC. So if we're looking to how the Southern issue can be properly included in any future peace negotiations, what has to be different uh, than what was tried in the past that led to uh, certain people not wanting to engage uh, in, for instance, the national dialogue on uh, the southern issue. Yes, during the National Dialogue Conference in 2013, the southern Hirak uh, did not participate. I think only one faction within the southern movement participated in the National Dialogue Conference. And even this faction from the uh, Hirak that participated withdrew from the NDC before the outcomes were released and before the NDC was concluded for several reasons. Uh, th this faction, for example, was ignored uh, during the NDC and they ended up, like I said, withdrawing. And a new, a new uh, group of representatives were formed uh, that were more in line with the regime at the time when Hadi was the president. And so this, the Southern team, or the working group for the Southern working group, it was supposed to be split 50-50 uh, between the North and the South, but these efforts were hindered. And I think we can say that the NDC has failed on this point. Even if, uh, if it were not... One of the main reasons for the war was the failure of the outcomes of the NDC. And I think that the core issue well, the core issue for the failure was the form of the state in the future, and an agreement was not reached. And this is something in which the southern issue plays a very prominent role. The southerners had said that Yemeni unification in 1990 had failed, and that this would need to be resolved for us to move forward. At the time, the UN Special Envoy Jamal bin Umar uh, understood this, and he believed that the main the main cause of the problem was the form of the state of what the future Yemeni state would look like between the north and the south. And I think that we all ha there, there was consensus that it would be a federal state, but we did not specify. No one specified how many federal regions there would be. There, there was supposed to be a committee that would be formed, and this committee would then decide the form of the state and how many federal regions there would be in it. But unfortunately, all of the political actors, including the Houthis, rejected this uh, solution, the federal uh, solution, and the war started. 
And so the outcomes of the NDC are no longer applicable because of the war, because all of the act relevant actors have rejected them. And the problem is still there. We're still dealing with the same problem over what the future state would look like. The SDC, for example, has its own vision about the future form of the state. It prefers the restoration of the pre-1990 state, whereas we would keep the humanitarian and social ties with the North, and that would be much better than the situation that we are in now. The animosity between the North and the South uh, continues and is only getting worse with Northerners not accepting Southerners and Southerners not accepting Northerners. And this is one of the symptoms that we're seeing for this problem. Unless there are just and equitable solutions for the Southern issue, I do not think that a political process would succeed and be sustainable. If, if we want if we were to go back to dialogue this working group or 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 this uh, negotiations delegation made up of all of the components of the PLC would need to be formed and a political process and dialogue would need to discuss all of the issues starting with the southern issue if an agreement is reached then i think there it would be easy to have dialogue with the houthis and other groups but if we cannot reach an agreement even within the plc and within its negotiation team then i don't think it will be able to have a dialogue or negotiations with the houthis or anyone else the problems will only get worse all right, just just to just to confirm, I got that right. The 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 preference for the STC at this point uh, would be then an independent state in southern Yemen based on pre nineteen ninety borders, rather than in any sort of federal arrangement that includes either uh, two federal regions or more. Yes. For, for us in the STC, our strategic objective and our struggle is to gain independence for the South. But we're open to all options. I think they can all be discussed. Why don't we discuss these options? But for, for me to be marginalized and for me to be told that my uh, my vision is wrong and then you want me to go into dialogue with you, I think that's would be unacceptable for anyone. I, I think we're all in, the way forward is for us to sit down at a dialogue and for all options to be put on the table. Don't impose anything. Don't put any ceilings or limitations on anyone's vision. We can we can discuss these things for a year or two or even 20 years. We can negotiate and hold this dialogue until we reach a solution and everyone is happy with the results. And I think that's what we need now for us to have uh, negotiations on equal footing. The crisis and all of its political and social ramifications were all due to, uh, we believe that this is due to the failure of unification in 1990. We need to look into why it failed. What were the factors that led to its failure? And why did we get to the situation that we are in today? If we recognize that, if we can recognize that in our dialogue with each other, and if we are ready and have good intentions to to reach real solutions i think that would be possible one that everyone is content with thank you doctor i'll ask uh, one more question before i open it up uh, to the audience uh, i'm sure everybody's aware that uh, the two primary backers of the internationally recognized government have been the uae and saudi arabia but there have also been points of divergence uh between riyadh and abu dhabi um from your perspective, how are differences uh, between the UAE and Saudi Arabia in terms of their interests in Yemen and the region reflecting on the cohesion of the internationally recognized government? And how, what have there been any efforts in place to potentially de-escalate in Yemen so it's not uh, as an arena for uh, score settling for other people in the region, as some people, as some analysts have uh, described? I, I don't I don't think that there are real differences between them when it comes to Yemen uh, between Saudi Arabia and the UAE and even these differences these are differences between them as a state I think there, there might have differences in opinion or, or of, of issues between them on security matters or economic matters. But when it comes to the Yemeni file, I think they are in agreement. And I think that uh, they, they form a unified front. They're all, they all support, both of them support Yemen, they support peace efforts, and they support attempts to, uh, to have a dialogue and the government and the PLC.
Thank you, uh, doctor, very much. Um, for now, uh, we'll move on to the second portion of uh, the call, which is the question and answer one. Um, if uh, uh, participants would like to ask a question, please raise your hands uh, and I will unmute you. Uh, we'll take about probably two to three guests at a time. And uh, remember, please uh, keep your interventions uh, brief and focused on a single question to give as many people uh, time as possible. All right, uh, I guess for the first two questions, we'll start with uh, my colleague Abdul Ghani, uh, and then we'll move on to uh, Frederick uh, Krampitz. So Abdul Ghani, I'm gonna unmute you right now. You have the floor. Salam, Dr. Nasser. Hello, uh, Dr. Nasser. My name is Abdul Ghani Riani. Uh, you said something that is very important, that before we talk about the form of the state, we need to first assess why unification failed in the first place. And so my question to you, if we review or assess the failure with the reasons for the failure of, of unification, and if solutions were put forth to ensure that this failure would not continue and to ensure that there would be unification on equal footing between the two sides, the north and the south, would you accept this solution? If one was proposed, yeah. should I answer? Or should we take the other questions? Okay, I guess I'll answer. I, I think yes, it's it's natural. If if we look into the core of the problem, and it's normal that if we look at the the core of the problem and assess why we failed, then we will reach a solution. If uh, if uh, uh, unification was attractive to us and we wouldn't uh, refuse it but if it, unification is something that marginalizes excludes me and takes away my rights I wouldn't accept it even if it was two brothers in a, sing in a single household if you felt like your brother was too harsh with you was taking what's yours then it would be normal for you to want to leave that household and go live somewhere else Okay, uh, next we'll go to uh, Frederick. Um, I'll unmute you now. And for all participants, uh, please also shortly introduce yourself and your affiliation so everybody uh, has some context for your questions. Thank you. Yes, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much uh, for this panel. My name is Frederick Krampitz, and I'm working for a German media development organization. Uh, as we just learned, the STC and uh, the Southerners in general were not part of the National Dialect Conference. Uh, however, I would love to hear your take on uh, the agreement that was made there of having at least 30% of women uh, included in, in in the political context in Yemen um, and how the STC um, yeah, plans to follow up on this, also given that the PLC is not adhering to the 30% quota, as far as I know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frederick. We'll take one more uh, question before we go to uh, Dr. Apology for his answer. Uh, L. Uh, Clark. Hi. Uh, sorry, I didn't need to update my name. My name is Lauren Clark. I'm a writer, editor, and journalist, background in women's studies in uh, North Africa and the MENA region. And I, uh, my question is, I would say an extension of the previous question. I wanted to know, as we're talking about the unification of the state, if there have been any on the ground efforts, not necessarily those women who were in the, the political arena, who are in the um, uh, in, with meeting with any of the governmental delegations, but particularly women who were on the ground, whether they work in agriculture, whether they are mothers, whether they uh, are organizers on the ground, if there have been any efforts to assess their particular methods of how or strategies or ideas that they have in how they can bring about unity amongst all the different governance and amongst all the conflicting um, regions within that time? And if so, what have been any, have there been any reports that are currently assessing this? Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, doctor, if uh, you could answer those two questions whenever you're ready. Thank you. With regards to the 30% quota, the STC has been fully supportive of the role of women, and, and not just at the 30% quota. I don't think we have any uh, objections to this. And women in the South and their role and the role that they've played in the public sphere uh, has been significant. They were they were the, some of the first doctors and, and government officials in the state. And we still support this, even though the role of women 
group is marginalized in the previous period. And this uh, marginalization is due to many factors, many for us to go into at length. But we believe we support this uh, approach. And the st within the STC and all of its various bodies and committees, women have a significant presence. And I think even more than the 30% quota. Before unification, women in the South, uh, or after unification, the role of women decreased in the public sphere, especially in the South. Uh, women, women in the South played an important role in the government and in many government institutions. But after 1919, after unification, these gains were reversed. And I think if you look back into what the reasons were for this, one of the main reasons was the Islamist political parties uh, that and the role that they played in weakening women and their participation and forcing women, for example, to wear the hijab. But we hope that women can play an active role in this. And we don't think that we don't want women to wait for others to, to give them the rights. I think that women... Are, uh, the role that they play is very important. They can play a significant role in regaining these rights. And I think that we want we want them to play even more of a role than, than men do. Okay, I'm going to go to the next uh, two names on my list. Uh, we'll start with Hisham, and then we'll go to Amanda. So, Hisham, uh, whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank the Sana'a Center for organizing this very important session. I would like to thank Dr. Nasser al Khubaji for, for his time and for giving us updates on the southern issue. I have several questions, but I would like to start by introducing myself. I am Hisham Ziadi. I am a television broadcaster and I'm working on my PhD in political science and international relations. Due to the nature of the situation in Yemen, and specifically the southern issue, the, the, STC, uh, the STC's vision for secession of the South or independence of the South. Nasser, I think you, Dr. Nasser, I think you've seen that the world is not really, the international community is not really supportive of secessionist movements. I think we've seen this in many different areas the, uh, around the world. Uh, like the situation in between Azerbaijan and Armenia, and uh, with the international community not really being supportive of secessionist movement. So does the STC still believe that the international community might change its mind and it might support uh, secession, especially since many different countries around the world face a similar problem? Okay, uh, to Amanda next. Hello, this is Amanda Mouawad from Agence France Press. Marhaba, um, Amanda Mouawad from Wikelt France Press. Marhaba, Dr. Hello, Dr. Nasser. My question to you is, President Zubaydi said in an interview last week or two weeks ago, I believe, that the main demand of the STC in the negotiations with the Houthis is for a restoration of southern Yemen with complete sovereignty. You said that you have been excluded from the negotiations between the Saudis and the Houthis. Have the Houthis at least been informed of the demands of the PLC and of the STC, especially this demand for a return to an independent Yemen so that there can be negotiations with the Houthis, especially since there is no formal political process, like you said, or at least no direct political negotiations between you and the Houthis. Thank you. I'll start by answering the, the last question first. There, like I said, there are no direct talks with the Houthis. The Houthis know very well the, the objectives and the vision of the STC and the Southern Movement. And at a, at a certain point in their history, they supported the Southern Movement uh, before 2014, before the uh, Houthis invaded the South and invaded the capital and overthrew the legitimacy. There was, they had sympathies for the Southern uh, issue and the Southern people. But after the Houthis overthrew the legitimate authorities and invaded the South for the second time, 
and which led to the creation of the southern of the southern resistance now the position of the houthis has changed it's not just that the houthis want to take over all of the north they want to take over the south as well and even want to expand outside of yemen's borders and like i said we don't have any direct talks or negotiations with the houthis with regards to the first question uh, the question by Hisham on the, uh, the issue of secession. We're not, we're not demanding secession. We want to uh, restore the state. And I think there's a difference between that. We want to restore the southern state because we were a state. We were a sovereign state on its own. And that's how Yemen unification came to be. Two independent sovereign states unified. The People's Democratic Republic of Yemen in Adan and the Yemen Arab Republic in the north. These two states unified, and there were differences between them, leading to a, uh, to a war in 1994, and with that war, the north was able to invade and take over and annex the south. And just like Abdul Ghani Iriani said in his question, why don't we look into the reasons for the failure of this unification and see what mistakes were made? And if we deal with these mistakes, we might be able to reach an agreement. And but for you, but for you to refuse this solution outright and for you to refuse any dialogue outright is the is the mistake or is the problem. We, they don't want to recognize that we were once a state on our own. Recognize my cause and my demands, and I will recognize yours and we can reach an agreement and reach solutions that are sustainable and acceptable for both of us we're not waiting we're not, we don't want the international community to, to do it to do anything for us the, there is a popular will on the ground the will of the people and they're the one these they're the ones who can make their own history and they're the ones who can make this decision whether they want to remain in a unified state or to leave it but no one can impose it no one can impose a solution that we do not accept and do not want on us. And I think that this is a decision to be made by the people, not by the political elites. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll take three questions now in the following order that I, that I receive them. So we'll start off with uh, Noor al-Baghdadi and then go to Balkis and then to Adel Dushela. So Noor, tafadale. Uh, Hello everyone, thank you Dr. Nasser for your time. I was in Lahaj today and I met with a number of IDPs as well as the host communities. Uh, these were women who have lost their families and were forced to be uh, forced to leave their homes. There were women also who were facing uh, many problems in their areas of displacement. These Yemenis are the stories usually that we do not hear, the stories that we don't hear in these kinds of discussions and the peace process and so how do you plan for this future while taking into account the needs of the of the civilians in the areas that you administer these people's needs are in uh, the economy and in service provision and so how do you and the stc give a priority to this based on what i understood you said that you were open to dialogue and discussions but wh what is the position of the stc towards these people do you uh, do you understand what their needs are for example so that you can provide the basic services and needs that they have Okay, uh, Balkis. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, Dr. Nasser, and I wish you a happy anniversary of the September and October uh, revolutions. If the negotiations between the Houthis and Saudi Arabia continue in the way that they are, with the lack of transparency, and are not in line with the vision and the demands of the of you in the South, of the STC in the South, and the PLC, so what are the guarantees that you require, and also what options would you have in that case if they continue with the lack of transparency. That is my first question. My second question, as Northern women, we were always in awe of the rights that Southern women had. But now, after your most recent consultations, you did not include the single women's group in the South. There are Southerners for Peace, Southern Women for Peace, for example, and they were not con contacted and included. The only woman that you deal with are the women that you have appointed to the STC. I know that you will say that women have need to play a more active role and they need to lead the struggle but i want to hear 
The South has had a very excellent uh, history or experience for women. And there were many Southern women who were at the forefront of the Southern movement have been excluded from the most recent consultations that the STC held. And so how would you include them? Third, how do you and the STC deal with media de-escalation? How can the media, for example, and how can the STC uh, present the STC not as the enemies of uh, an enemy of Yemenis, but as one striving and struggling for the rights of the southern people? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. We will go to. Yeah. Sorry. We'll go to you for, uh, first, Doctor, uh, for uh, the the what question from Noah and the multiple questions. So, with regards to the IDPs, this is one of the functions of the government. This is the responsibility of the government, and I think that many of the ministers, especially the STC ministers, are very concerned with this issue, the issue of the IDPs, and they provide. The, the the possible support and uh, and assistance to them, but I think you know that the the state is in a very difficult position with revenues having gone down in the previous period. But there is a, a concern for the IDPs and for the provision of the services and needs that they have. The IDPs in the south today get better assistance and support than even the host communities. If we look at uh, many of these IDP communities. They might be getting more support and might be getting more help than even the, the host communities in, in Lahj or in any other government in the South. We don't have any problem with this or there are no systemic violations. And if there are any violations committed against them, we are prepared to stop them and to stand against them. These are IDPs and they deserve only assistance and support. With regards to the second question on the options and what options we might have if they can do, I don't want, we don't want to discuss any of these options now unless we get sufficient information on the talks and if there are publicized results for the talks between Saudi Arabia and the Houthis. If these results are not are negative, are not positive for us, we will have a very clear position uh, towards them at the, uh, at the right time, but we will not uh, do that before the time is right. I don't think it's the time for us to go into what we want or what we will do at that time. We, we have many options and all these options remain on the table and if with the time is right we can discuss them with regards to working with southern women and uh, and the ndc i think that the ndc or sorry the the southern consultations these consultations are continuing they have not ended there might there are there might be shortcomings and communicating, for example, with some of the women's groups, like you've mentioned, but the southern, the the components of the southern movement were all included, and they've all been accommodated. We've spent, we've sat down with them, we've reached an agreement, and there are still many ongoing activities as a part of these southern consultations. And based on what I've heard, the the women's union will be having a conference in the coming few days. And this point that you've mentioned uh, has been taken into account and it's something that we're working on correcting which is the inclusion of women in these consultations and the components that were not included it, it could be for for many reasons it could be uh, unintended mistake these issues will be uh, resolved with regards to the media and the role of the media the southern media i think has been presenting a very positive message it could be understood by some of you as not being positive or you might be or you might see that the, the, the social at the end of the day the STC is not responsible for for what is said on social media but other but the formal channels uh, like the Aden channel and the formal newspapers of the STC I don't think that it has expressed any form of animosity it has always been positive and I think that many people have seen this that it has played a very positive role there might be uh, individuals that you believe to be affiliated with STC but they're not speaking on behalf of the STC when they see these things over okay we'll go to Ashia and then Adil uh, so Ashia whenever you're ready hello everyone I am Ashia and I'm a researcher from India um, so in my understanding, external support or intervention 
comes at a cost. So I would like to request you to please let me understand what are the interests of the UAE in South Yemen and especially in its support for the SDC. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll go over to Adel. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ryan. Thank you, Dr. Nasser, for your time. I had two questions, Dr. Nasser. The first question, there are real and valid concerns that the North will be taken over by the Houthis, where they will establish their sectarian theocratic state based on the pre-1990 borders. And this is what they're trying to achieve through, uh, through the use of military means. And all of these different components that reject the, this rule by the Houthis have these concerns and you in South Yemen want to uh, restore the state and you're presenting yourself as the sole representative of the southern cause but there is opposition whether in the east and Hadramaut and different governorates and you are saying that you're trying to deal with these differences within the southern consultation and so my question is are you prepared to go into dialogue under the auspices of the national, a nationally unified state from al Mahara to Sa'da, what a dialogue where we can discuss the various political and economic issues relating to authority and the distribution of resources, or by dialogue, do you mean that we have to first recognize an independent South and then go into negotiations? There are some who would like to go into negotiations with you and to hold a dialogue, but they want to do this within the unified state. Are you prepared to hold? the dialogue under that framework thank you thank you very much for these questions i think this is a very important question there are two issues here there's the southern issue and it is an issue caused by the failure of the unification process and second is the issue of uh authority and, and, and governance. In the South, we're, we want to go back to deal with this issue of how can we go back to the position that we were in and go into negotiations on equal footing between the North and the South. But the other issue that you spoke about is an issue of governance and authority. What's happening now with the Houthis and the, and the legitimacy is a difference on how they want to govern. The Houthis want to govern in their own way, whereas the other parties want to govern through a democratic process, but most of them are have a very clear geographic basis or origin and are not a part of this uh, or are not focused on the Southern issue. But when I say dialogue and negotiations, I want us to sit down at a table, put all of these issues on the table, and through dialogue and negotiations, we can reach a solution. We're, we're not we're not against any kind of dialogue if on any issue. And we don't come in with any preconditions for the negotiations. These issues are, and all, everyone has said this, that the southern issue is a central issue, that the core issue in the conflict in Yemen is the southern issue. And this, the southern issue started because of the failure of unification and the war in 1990. And so if we go back to it, assess it, and hold a dialogue, we can. if we reach a solution, we can. that would be great. If we do not, we can try to find another way to deal with it. But for us to refuse it outright, to refuse to look into this issue, for you, for you to refuse to look into the roots of the problem with unification and say, oh, what has happened has already happened, let us start over, I think is is an unrealistic way and impractical way of dealing with it. I think we need to go back and discuss why the southern issue came to be, what were the failures of unification, and then have a negotiation. Recognize me as a southerner, and I'll recognize you as a northerner. And if we recognize each other that way, I think it'll be easier for us to reach a solution. But if we do not, then I think it'll be very difficult for us to hold this dialogue. With regards to the question on the UAE's interests, I think this is something you could ask the UAE. Uh, for us at the, in the SDC, the relationship with the UAE is one is a brotherly relationship, is one of and, and one that is providing assistance. The UAE is not providing assistance just to Yemen, but it is a country that has spent its resources and its capacity in supporting the whole Arab world and even outside of the Arab world. And I think that that is a characteristic that our brothers in the UAE have always had, their generosity and their attempts to try to sp spread good throughout the region. And I think their interest is in the stability of the region, the stability of Yemen, which will have a significant impact on the Gulf. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, 
Uh, this is going to be the final round on uh, her first question, and then I think Hisham also has a follow up, uh, and then after that we'll uh, uh, let uh, Dr. Khobaji go after him, uh, giving us so much time. Uh, so Amanda, whenever you're ready, please. Sorry, Dr. Nasser, I might not have expressed my question properly. My question was, if you have informed Saudi Arabia of your demands, not the, the Houthis, have you, have, do the Saudis understand what your demands are? And so you've said that the Saudis have excluded you and the other components in, these, uh, in this process. But the Houthis, during their negotiations with the Houthis, have they presented these demands <laughs> to them? I think the Saudis recognize our demands uh, even more than we do. And so they, they know what they are. We've conveyed them to them. Okay. Uh, we'll go to uh, Hisham. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak once again. And I would also like to thank Nasser Khubaji for his answer. I think this is a very important meeting and it has been very informative. And so I had uh, more questions. First, President Aydaros Zubaydi, the president of the STC, has said previously that, they, that the STC wants negotiations with all Yemeni components without any preconditions and not based on the three references to the political process, whereas all of the sponsors of uh, the process in Yemen, including Saudi Arabia, the UAE, the US, the UK, have always reiterated the importance of these three references. They are the GCC initiative, the outcomes of the National Dialogue Conference, and UNSC Resolution 2216, all of which stress the, the, sov uh, the sovereignty and unity of uh, Yemeni territory. And so could the STC go into negotiations based on these three references? My second question is, why does the STC insist insist on presenting itself as the representative of the southern people? Why does it not present itself as one of the components uh, in the south, like the southern movement, like the Hadramaut Inclusive Conference, like the National Hadrami Council, and all of these other political actors that represent the south and might have differing points of view and might not be uh, in agreement with the STC? Why does the STC continue to insist that it is the sole legitimate representative of the south? Thank you, Hisham. Well, first, we have never insisted or presented ourselves as the sole representatives of the South, but we are. We represent the Southern Project, and other Southern actors might have, might be representing a different vision or a different objective. We are the carriers of the project for an independent South, and others might have or might have their view for a unified Yemen. We're not against that. That is the right. Anyone who supports an independent South, the restoration of the South. Uh, can, can work with us. And I think that we can, through this dialogue and through these consultations, even if we differ on our objectives, at the end of the day, our main goal is the same. It's the welfare of, of the people and to improve the situation in the country. We've never claimed to be the sole representatives of the South. There are many Southern components. They have their own viewpoints and we respect them and we have continued to uh, conduct dialogue with them. Some of them we coordinate much closer with, but I don't think we've ever claimed to be the sole representatives. With regards to the issue of the three references, we've had a very clear position with regards to the references. The Riyadh Agreement was also very clear with regards to the references. These were some of the main points that were discussed uh, during that process and we said that we have nothing to do with these references. These references the STC was formed after these references came into effect and so we are not committed to them and we do not have a responsibility to be so. Uh, the Riyadh Agreement in the introduction, in the preamble to the Riyadh Agreement, we have said that we are not committed to these three references, but the coalition and the legitimacy are committed to them, but we as the SDC are not. The GCC initiative, for example, was an attempt to resolve a problem between the ruling party, the GPC at the time, and the joint meeting parties, the opposition. And the NDC outcomes also practically have ended, just like the GCC initiative. Otherwise, we would not have had a war if the NDC outcomes were still in effect. And Resolution 2216 
I think is also is no longer valid if we look at the reality on the ground today. The, this resolution says that the Houthi militias must disarm and that no one recognizes them. But now the, the, these militias are recognized and there are direct negotiations going on between international actors and them. And it is impossible for us to ask the Houthis now to disarm unless we use the military option and are able to force them or break them militarily. Then maybe that could be an option. But now, in the way that the situation is on the ground now, with the Houthis still being the military victor, I think Resolution 216 is, would be difficult to implement. Uh, what the Houthis are doing now is an attempt to to waste more time and to rearrange uh, their issues internally, but, and I think this will only lead to the war resuming in the future. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to leave it here for questions for today. Um, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Nasser for his, uh, his time and for his willingness to uh, engage in a very frank discussion on uh, some pretty interesting questions. Uh, doctor, if you have any concluding remarks uh, you'd like to make... Thank you very much. I just wanted to thank all of the participants for their questions and for their comments. I, I was very happy to get these questions, and I hope that I've clarified uh, the points that you, you might have uh, wanted to ask about. If there are any further questions, if you would like to further clarifications, uh, you can contact me, uh, and I think can, we can have discussions with uh, any one of the participants in this call. I wish you a good evening. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you for listening and for being here. I'm sorry if I didn't answer anything or uh, there was anything that you misunderstood. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you again, doctor. And I'll uh, leave it on those concluding words and just uh, thank everybody for our uh, their participation in, in uh, future Yemen media calls. Thank you very, very much.